Yes. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, well, hello. Um, so, old data for new insights. And this is a uh, talk about a study on fertilizer and grain prices and how that affects um, opportunities for, for increasing food production in Sub Saharan Africa. Most of this work, almost everything, was done by Camila uh, Bonilla, who is now at Wageningen and at the time was a uh, PhD student in Davis. By Jordan Chamberlain um, as well, uh, was then at CIMIT, now at FAO, uh, and I also made some contributions. Camilla has talked quite a bit about this work and she asked uh, you know, me to speak about it today just to uh, hear it from a different perspective, I guess. Um, and so what I want to do today is emphasize the two sides. One is, is, is um, you know, sort of the content, you know, what was the question and what did we, what, you know, what did we, what did we find, but also uh, pay attention to sort of the underlying, sort of some of the underlying data science aspects, if you like. Um, the reason being that, you know, we're, we're, this is organized by the um, big data agriculture platform um, of the CGIR. And I think there are some in interesting um, lessons that we've learned. Uh, we've also been supported by them and work with them in many ways. So, so I think, uh, you know, this, this project is ending, I believe. Um, or even at least this phase, and 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 so it's it's great to be able to present here and to highlight some of these aspects of our work. So this is the paper that um, Jawu uh, referred to, um, and I just just highlighted the thing that you know we we use machine learning based on you know twelve thousand uh, observations from across Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think that in terms of um, you know you can think many things of this of this paper, and you may like it or not, but I think. Uh, personally, I, you know, that methodologically, you know, there, there is, is really something that um, uh, opens the door to much more uh, future work that could improve what we have done uh, considerably. Just as a background, I don't think that any of uh, you on the, um, on this, uh, who are present here today uh, don't know this, but generally Africa has relatively low crop yields, um, which is associated with relatively low fertilizer use. Uh, whereas there are also high yield gaps. It's not that, it, you know, you cannot really produce um, uh, food crops in Africa at, at high yields, at, at, as high as you might have elsewhere, um, depending on where you are, of course. Um, but that is just currently not the case. And there are many reasons for that. Um, maybe very good reasons sometimes, and maybe I mean, not as good a reason, but um, the issue perhaps is that because there are so many reasons, uh, they may not apply everywhere. So, you know, one of the things I tend to say, all of these, you know, it's all true. Yeah, it's because of poor soils, because prices are bad, it's all true. But we'd like to know a bit better, you know, what, what is true where, under what conditions, and what are the implications, both for fertilizer use, but of course, also for all, all kinds of other things, including, you know, alternative ways to um, improve crop yields, but, all, but, but ultimately often our goal is, is rather, or interest is more, you know, um, uh, food security and livelihoods, which may, you know, require entirely different uh, approaches. But but today, uh, our focus is really about, you know, uh, fertilizer use. How profitable is it then? You know, where and where is it profitable and how profitable is it? So to be able to answer that question, uh, we need to know for any location, so they're just generally for the continent, but for you know, specific locations within the continent, well, what is the price of fertilizer, the inputs, what is the price of grain, so the output, and what's the crop response to fertilizer? Because well, with these three things, um, you can look at profitability. If, the, if there's a very good response to fertilizer, meaning you get much more grain with a little bit of fertilizer, well, and even if fertilizer is expensive, it might still be attractive to do that. However, if the grain price is really, really low, well, then all of a sudden it's not attractive. I mean, these things are obvious. This is economics 101 in, in many ways. So I think all of you understand that, 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 that these three things should, should, should determine the profitability of fertilizer use. But I, I would like to point out that, that you know, agronomists tend to look at fertilizer use efficiency. Economists tend to use that, look at, um, uh, of course, economic efficiencies and prices. 
but what hasn't been happening very much is integrating that, let alone integrating that in sort of in, in a spatial framework that lets you understand um, how this all varies over space and, and uh, what this means at, at particular locations. So let's go through these um, three steps. First, the prices, and then with a bit more attention to the response functions. So um, this is the here you see it represent the raw data that Camila was able to um, uh, collect uh, together with Jordan and um, and other colleagues, um, also from IFPRI. The um, Two data sources really. One is the Africa Fertilizer Survey in red and the LSMS ISA, ISA so the World Bank Gates funded survey. So, where you have those surveys, you have a lot of data, the blue points in a, in a few countries, but in, in most countries, these haven't been done. And I would also say the quality of those data are turned out to be really, really poor. You know, those are from these general surveys where they ask, you know, maybe a thousand questions including about fertilizer and the prices and quantities and you get the craziest of numbers you know where kilos are confused with bags and so you know is it four kilo for bags of fertilizer you bought and then you know the prices really uh, change a lot so so um there is data there isn't as much data as we would like and 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 all through i will keep emphasizing well it'd be really nice if you had a, a bit better flow of up to dates and spatially representative data about these things that really matter if you want to if you want to think about fertilizer use. So the black areas in the background is where the main crop areas are. So we have you know we covered most of the important crop areas, but not you know Sudan or or Zimbabwe or uh, Angola or, or South Africa. So having these observations, you know, a price of, of fertilizer at either a market, which was the Africa Fertilizer Survey, or that somebody paid at some point, um, you, we can then try to generalize uh, the prices. And, and that's what, what Camila did. And here, here are some examples for countries and for you know, West Africa at your left and East Africa at your right hand side. Um, at the top, by country, these are all relative prices. So it's the price divided by the median price for the country. And so let's consider Senegal um, clear, you know, more expensive, 1.3 ish um, in the south, cheap in the north, relatively cheap in the north. Ghana, similar, uh, Uganda, well, it's north south is inverse, but with clear spatial patterns. Uganda, you know, had been described before, you know, fertilizer comes in from Kenya and it gets more and more expensive the further away it gets from sort of where, where it enters the country and where the main markets are. Senegal, um, I don't know what causes this. Maybe, maybe it actually comes down from, from the north uh, via Morocco, Mauritania. Um, southern area here, you have to go through the Gambia to get there, so I could see why that's more expensive. Um, Ghana, you know, Cote d'Ivoire again, the port. Ghana is the opposite. You know, it's more, it's cheaper, uh, closer to, you know, further away from the, from the coast. And so, and so, we, we've seen these patterns. We don't necessarily know why they are, but but uh, the way they are. Sometimes we can explain them with theory. Sometimes they go against theory. Sometimes we don't see much of a pattern at all. You know, like Kenya, yeah, there's variation, but it's not huge. Um, bottom line is, you know, there, there's a lot more to learn, um, and there can be important variation within a country. You know, here you go, you know, 80% to 30, lower than the average price to 30% higher than the average price. That can make a huge difference in, in, in considering uh, profitability. So just using average national prices, you know, it's sometimes the best you can do, but it's not ideal. These are all relative within a country. Now, if you look between countries, it gets much uh, a bigger, oops, the difference. Um, 60 cents per, k per kilogram, uh, for, of urea in, in, in Ghana versus about, you know, uh, 160 in Burkina Faso, which again is make, 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 make this gradient a bit hard to understand how that, how that precisely works. But it, clearly there are, there are also very large differences, you know, between countries to consider. Likewise, in, in, in um, East Africa, Kenya being very cheap, uh, Uganda is very expensive. Now, in part, this may be because of the problems with currencies, you know, all of this was transferred into, you know, international uh, dollars that 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 take care of uh, just for uh, change, you know, differences in prices that you have locally. But still, those are you know um, mathematical transformations that may not reflect reality perfectly, or they never can. 
Uh, the good thing is that in the end, we look at uh, the relative price between input and output. And so that that adjustment doesn't matter so much. But but there, but clearly uh, th these differences are real and are important. We also looked at other, this is all urea. It, it turns out that uh, you know, urea is, is the most commonly um, uh, available fertilizer, whereas other products, uh, it varies a lot in the region. Um, so we had most data on urea, so we did most of the work on that, and then we predicted prices for, for other products from the urea price, which was, you know, reasonably possible, according if you look at these uh, these relationships between urea and NPK and diammonium phosphate um, and, and other products. All right, so this, that's very briefly work on fertilizers. We did similar work on food prices. And, you know, again, every, every time I say we, it's like, you know, Camila does, 80 percent, uh, Jordan 15, and I do five. Um, here, um, here's some data on on food prices that that they collected. Um, like fertilizer, you have different products. Here, you have, of course, different different foods, and you know, maize, rice, millet, what have you. Um, and so, we're able to collect data from across the continent. But of course, yeah, you know, it's, it's again very sparse. There, there are there's few countries where you have really uh, data for many markets that 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 can be used. The good thing is the, the interesting thing about food prices, though, is different than fertilizer. Is that there's there's much more variability between years and between seasons. Uh, fertilizer prices change as well, of course, and I should have mentioned that when I talked about the urea. You know, that's, that's sort of an average price over the past decade or so. Now, with the current spike in energy prices, uh, all of our analysis has changed a bit, or or should ha would have changed if we did it now, uh, because urea has become much more expensive. And, and, and the prospect of using it um, uh, less good. So here you see some so, so, so some of the uh, uh, results. Um, very clear seasonal variability in uh, food, food prices and very much as expected. So we were able to model that quite nicely, essentially, you know, a, a well-known pattern that um, towards the end of the growing season, you know, just before the harvest when, you know, supplies are really short, so prices go up. And then after the growing season, after the harvest, so that happens sort of at its peak, they start going down, not immediately. So harvest is typically like here and then it goes down for a month or two, and then they start going up, back up again. So the seasonality was very clear. And you also see that, you know, um, prices are low in, in um, you know, all of across West Africa in January, and then just, just quite high just before that. And in, um, the opposite sort of part of the continent seasonally, you know, you get, you, it's, it's in June that the prices are low, and that all made a lot of sense. What 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 we weren't able, weren't as successful with, uh, is in understanding year to year variability. Meaning that you know you would expect that in a very dry year, after a dry year, uh, you know, supply would be lower and then price would go up. We saw a little bit of that, but not much. You know, so there, there's certainly more to 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 understand there. To what extent that has to do with trade or or other other ways of buffering or or, or you know replacement of one food for another? Who knows? I, I certainly don't. Spatial variation was was reasonable, but also there's a lot of um, variability in prices. We see that we didn't quite understand. You know, we, we we just have so much data, and 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 much more could be done there. Probably more, you know, one of the things that, that we're continuing this work uh, with is to do more in-depth, you know, within the country research to to look at, at, at that uh, yeah, but just with a bit more precision. All right, so now we have these prices. We have nitrogen, uh, this example, and, and we can estimate other fertilizers. We have maize prices, which we focus on maize being, you know, a, a big important crop across the continent that responds well to fertilizer. And then we have this relative price, and and that you know it's an important one to consider. It's a bit uh, rough here or grainy, but you know what comes out you know in the end is that even though we look a lot of these uh, subnational prices, in the end it's you know the differences are are partly overwhelmed by the big differences between countries. So it's not to say that it's not important variation within countries to consider, but if you look at the continental scale, like you know fertilizer. Is very expensive in in Uganda and Mali. So Uganda, you get to this twenty relative price, meaning that you need twenty kilograms of maize to pay for one kilogram of fertilizer. So you know that immediately tells you something about uh, uh, or nitrogen. Sorry. Um, so it immediately tells you something about uh, you know how 
good your response curve must be, uh, how much you know, how much more yield you must get out of one kilogram of um, your fertilizer to be able to even pay for that. Whereas you know, and and so these are these are countries where it's very expensive, and you know, I could call it Ghana and Kenya as where it's relatively cheap, South Africa especially cheap, and then you know, countries like Ethiopia and Tanzania. Uh, sort of, you know, in the middle. There's there's opportunities there, but but it's um it's not as easy as in Kenya, say, given given the same ecological conditions. And, and in fact, you know, Kenya and, and Ethiopia both have areas where you you can grow maize really well uh, ecologically, but economically, that you know, there there certainly are differences for, you know, because of this. Okay, so now let's go to that third uh, part, the the crop response to fertilizer. So here in the left, you see. You know, two possible response curves that both could be real and could have been published in some paper saying, oh, this is what we see. You know, we, we put more fertilizer on whatever whatever sort of is, and we get more crop yield, whatever whatever we're actually measuring. Could be low, it could be high, it could be even higher, it could also be really low. You know, in extreme cases, of course, in the, in the extreme, extreme case, if there's no rainfall, well, you know, whatever, you know, it will be, it will be flat, maybe even down. Um, and you know, and that is the problem in a way. It's the problem of generalization. All these curves exist; they're all real, um, but which one really applies where, and how do you determine that? And often it has been determined by, you know, using simulation models or, or you know, these, these crop models, which are great tools and and capture our formal knowledge in 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 very nifty ways. But the the problem with them is that they may not um, be able to actually make good predictions relevant for um, uh, or, or that, that captures all, all the other aspects that, that create variation in outcomes that these crop models sim simply uh, do not consider. So we were really interested in uh, building an empirical model where we say, well, let's, let's use as much as we can, just raw observations, ideally on farm, of course, um, because, of, because that's where really um, the conditions there is what really matters. You know, the, it, it may very well be that on experimental fields with perfect management, um, you can get very high yields. But if you can get that even at a larger field, let alone farm field, where now you have um, pest and diseases, labor shortage, what have you, and you know that that can be a big difference. In fact, I saw Six Snap was on the on the call, and, the, and she has a, a really interesting and very important paper uh, in PNS. I think it was about that that difference between what you even even under under perfect management, you know what you can do on a small plot is just not the same as what you can do in a large plot. Let alone what a farmer can do who has all kinds of other constraints. So that difference is really important. Um, nevertheless, most of our results is, is are based on um, formal experiments, some on farm, but many on research stations. And so our, our results are probably uh, of 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 these response curves are probably still somewhat inflated. So where do we get the data then, all this empirical data? Well, this is the um, why I think it's so nice to be able to give this talk here at, at um, you know, organized by um, the Big Data Platform. Because they've been very instrumental in keeping this um, open data spirit alive within CGIR and, and pushing it further. So this slide, this is a graph I made uh, about two years ago now. So it's it's a it's a bit dated. So all these these bars are probably further to the right now. But it shows how many open data sets. And with open, I mean at least I mean you know you, you can download. The licenses may vary, especially you know Simit you know has a bit troublesome with the licenses they provide. Um, but there are a lot of data sets you can at least have access to. Um, and if you look at at, at internationally. It's, you know, CCIR, oh, actually Indra is here, the French uh, National Research Institute, but all CCIR, and you get a university, CIRAD, I forget what CAC is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to them, maybe something Canadian. Um, uh, and then there, there are things like, the, you know, the USA uh, Feed the Future um, um, uh, programs, and there, there must be others that I haven't considered, I just overlooked them, but, but I really want to emphasize how important CTR has been in this open data and, and agriculture movement. You know, this is a movement that's very big in, in genomics or, or, you know, everything is open essentially, but also in ecology, agriculture, uh, it's a bit traditional, you know, agronomists, we are, you know, simple people. 
um, don't don't easily jump on bandwagons. You know, are realistic. You know, and um, and maybe sometimes a bit conservative. So so this is, this is something that needs to change. And CTR has really uh, uh, led the way and showed the way. And and and, and congratulations to you all. Um, the data is available. Uh, we were we couldn't have done this without Guardian, which is this website that allows you to search across all these data sets. So you can type in maize, fertilizer, and bam, you know, you you you, you get you get uh, many many hits uh, of, of data sets to download. So you know the ideal world is fair data, right? Findable, accessible, interoperable, and and reusable. So the findability and accessibility is is um, fantastic now compared to what it was 10 years ago when it was essentially zero. You, know, you had to go to papers and extract things from papers perhaps, or, or write, write authors and, and good luck. You know. um, much more needs to be done, can be done, but, but findability and accessibility has greatly improved and that's fantastic. Interoperability is the next um, uh, big frontier, I would say, um, because, you know, so Camila eventually, you know, Found, used 108 data sets that covered you know, 760 locations and these 12,000 or so observations. But for each of these 108 data sets, you had to write a script like this, and you know, and this is just a very small part of it. So she wrote 108 R scripts, sometimes very involved uh, uh, because of many, many problems with these data sets to process all 108 of them to be able to aggregate them into a single new data set that had at least, you know, maize yields, and something on for location, you know, where is it? Because then we can um, estimate the weather and the soil conditions and something on, on fertilizer. Even if it's a zero fertilizer, that's also important, you know, uh, uh, important information. So there's a lot of work to, to, to get this together. And, and towards the end, I'll come back to that, uh, you know, what we believe are ways forward with it. So putting it all together, you know, these 12,000 um, or uh, yeah, 12,000 observations, this is the raw data. Like, well, if you put it all together, yeah, you see uh, if you increase N and everything, you know, this average over, you know, what phosphate application may have been or any or location, so rainfall, anything. Well, you see, you know, the kind of response that you might expect that, you know, yield go up and then they and it, and it plateaus. But we use variation. Even, you know, somebody got eight tons almost per hectare with zero N. Well, I don't know how they do that. They must have fertilized a lot the year before. So, um, or who knows, you know, there was uh, what happened, but but so a lot of variability um, in a general trend. And so that's where machine learning comes in is where we can say, well, can we disentangle that? Can we sort of figure out what, 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 what not only what, what causes, what, that there's this trend because of N, but also, you know, why you have sometimes high and sometimes low uh, response curves. And so we use this random forest uh, method that I think is now well, you know, well established and well known. Uh, you know, can talk about its limitations and all that, but let's just focus uh, on other things right now. Um, here, just a quick comparison for two different models. We use the one to the left, and this is an older version, maybe in the paper, it's a little bit different, but you know, the gist is the same. If if you put all these things in, so N, P, and K applied, and you know, trying to explain yield. Um, some soil, uh, soil parameters, exchangeable uh, phosphate, uh, potassium. Uh, we put a longitudinal latitude as, as you know, a proxy for some for some regional um, effect that we don't really know what it is, um, but it turned out to be somewhat important uh, or explain as much as otherwise pH would. And you know, these things, of course, are not independent of each other. Uh, soil variables on the uh, overall didn't do too much if you add N, P, and K. Of course, you, and that makes sense. If you add a lot of fertilizer, your, your inherent soil fertility becomes less and less important unless you have, you know, things like, you know, huge tox toxicities or something like that. And we were able to explain, I think, more than this in the end, but, you know, a lot of the variation was, you know, was captured apparently by this model. If you take out N, P, and K, so if you don't consider fertilizers, we only use the uh, data where, um, uh, where there was no fertilizer uh, applied. Uh, obviously, the, so the zero treatments, you know, now the soil uh, parameters become more, more important, uh, well, because NP and K were, were all zero. And I should explain this, basically what, is, what it means is if, you know, the further this dot is to the right, uh, the more important the variable is, meaning that if you took the variable or if you randomize this variable, if, it, if there was, if, you know, 
if you just assign a random number to the to the nitrogen application instead of if if it's true the true application this is how much worse the model would get meaning that you know in this case if you just instead of the true clay content of the soil of the location you just gave it a random number it really wouldn't matter because clay wasn't picked it just wasn't important so if you have fertilized it's really NMP that matters if you don't have fertilizer at low levels, yeah, now actually the, the native soil supply, um, you know, the, the potassium nitrogen supply start start to be important. All right, so that is the background. Now we have this model. Oh well, and here and here then is you know this is similar to that to that original uh, raw data, but you can then look at these. You, know, you can unpack these things a bit and look at this case the partial dependence of nitrogen on yield. So if you everything else being an average, you could do it different ways. You know how, you know, what the empirical response curve is. It's a bit um, wiggly, uh, but, you know, it's similar to what you, what you might uh, expect to get. Um, um, so, so, you know, it, it's not entirely unreasonable, um, but, but, you know, don't, don't side me on saying that this is a perfect model. I think there's a lot more work to be done that can be done to, to um, uh, get better models um, by combining, you know, what we know formally uh, and and all this empirical data, but but you know uh, that's that's for uh, all of you to uh, contribute to. So now we have the, this model, and now we could look do th simple things like this. Well, what what if you um, applied a small amount, in this case, 50 kg of nitrogen or 50 kg of phosphate? What would your response if it be? And I only show this you know, to point out. Well, it it varies. You know, in the in the Sahel, nitrogen, particularly the, you know the, the top, you know the north of the Sahel. Or the true Sahel, and you know, it doesn't do that much. It's not that nitrogen limited. It's you know it's water limited and it's phosphate limited. Phosphate, you know, is 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 more important. And I was really happy to see this come out. I mean, that this is you know when I was a student, but um, imagining and you know they were doing a lot of research in Mali, and that was sort of their big finding after the drought in the Sahel is that uh, you know everybody's talking about drought, 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 and they say, well, you know, yeah, and it, of course in dry years perhaps, but it's really phosphate is 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 the main limiting factor. And I was just uh, really pleased to see that you know without putting any of that prior knowledge and just putting the data in that some of these uh, known uh, patterns come out or did come out. Um, Ethiopia apparently phosphate is not so much the issue. It's, it's actually not. It's where, where nitrogen is is or or equally uh, important. And of course, they always are equally or always are both important. But it is interesting to see these relative uh, uh, differences in, in in responses. So now let's put it together and talk about um, profitability. And so at your left hand side, you see sort of simplified average um, uh, response functions for fertilizer applied. And fertilizer here is really many different fertilizers. Because what we did is we, I think we, we did about 800 or so different combinations of NP and K, um, run the model. So we run, the, run this predictive model um, almost a thousand times. For you know, zero nitrogen, some phosphate, some uh, potassium, and and you know, all these combinations, and then looked at um, you know the response here, and and it's just it's just kilogram of fertilizer because it could be you know it's never just nitrogen, it's always coming you know, well, it can be in some cases, but but it's just kilograms of fertilizer, and which, whichever one works best. So this is sort of the ideal world if you have always had the perfect blend to get your highest yield according to this model. And so what you see here, and maybe that's one of the interesting comparisons, Ethiopian Kenya, as I alluded to earlier, uh, pretty good response curves, relative at least to, on average for the country, uh, you know, some places it will be much higher, other places lower, uh, relative to say Namib Namibia, uh, where you have um, probably more water limitation. So, you know, you, you just, you can add fertilizer, but if, if soil fertility is not a limiting factor anymore, it won't help you too much. Uganda also pretty good. You know, and that's also well known. And you actually would expect you Uganda even to be higher. You know, Uganda is known for having actually pretty good, you know, uh, pretty good soil. So at least in some parts of the country. Okay, so so you get this difference difference in, in the responses, and that that's that's um, uh, you know to be expected. But now let's look at the profitability. Um, I already highlighted as I said, you know, Kenya has cheap fertilizer uh, and they're relatively good, therefore. Uh, from the farmer's perspective, you know, relative price between maize and fertilizer, at least better than Ethiopia. What this means then for profitability is that um, 
the highest profitability you can get with fertilization of, of maize in, in Kenya is around 125 kilograms per hectare. And you could make about $180 per hectare when you do that. Um, even Ethiopia, although it has the same response curves be, because these, these prices that aren't as good, um, the, opti the, the maximum profitability is about half the fertilizer uh, application. And the, the profitability of doing that is also about half. Let's just keep, keep it simple. And then, well, you can, then let's go to Uganda, where you know pretty good response curves. Well, yeah, you can you can apply up to 50 um, kilograms, and you make about $40. Um, and that's really important to consider. There's two aspects of it. A, well, that 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 um, that difference, but also that while in, while in Uganda, yeah, you 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 can really um, increase yields quite a bit. Because if you do that 50 kilograms, well, that's the nice thing about low application fertilizer is that this curve is still steep. Uh, so if you go from zero at, at say 1200 here to 50, about, about 2400, hey, you could maybe even double your yield almost with 50 kg of fertilizer, or maybe not quite that much, but something like that. Um, and it wouldn't even cost that much, only $39. Uh, 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 so only uh, um, it wouldn't cost that much, but so this is the one I'm looking at here. Uh, no, red here. Whatever it would cost, but you would only make thirty nine dollars, and that's also that's also an important uh, thing to consider. So we um, overall, basically, the conclusion of this work is well, you know, expectations of possible yields have been inflated. Realistically, if if you consider prices, they're much lower. But even at those lower prices, you know, our estimates of um, responses are probably a bit optimistic. And incentives may be weak in the sense that like, well, is it really, are you really going to, you know, how much do you care to make $40 by investing in fertilizer and doing all the work on a whole hectare of maize? There might be other ways to make money. There might be other ways to invest your um, maybe your $100 that you have to invest to make $40, you know, or is it, or, you know, so, so and. And that aspect is tricky to, to evaluate because you don't know too much about uh, alternative uh, opportunities that people have, but it's, it, it's really important to consider it. So now let's look at that across um, um, the board. So what is this maximum profitability? So these, you know, these, 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 these numbers here, uh, you know, the, the, where, where your profitability uh, curve peaks. Um, well, Overall, very high South Africa, you know, pretty low in some other places like Uganda. And here, you know, the associated um, maximum profitable yields, which is not quite the same either because, you know, it, 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 that depends partly on, on the profitability of fertilizer, but also partly depends on the inherent conditions. And, and but so now we have the two things. We know how much money can you make and what is the yield at that yield level. And so we can now consider this economic yield gap. And the economic yield gap is the difference between your highest yield or your yield at your most profitable um, fertilizer application and actual yield. And so we see that, yeah, that there are um, pretty low, you know, the yield gap is actually pretty low in South Africa because yields are, low, are, are already quite high. It's also low in Uganda because, you know, it's just not that profitable. Uh, but still pretty high in parts of, of, of Kenya, Tanzania, and, and some other parts of the continent. Here you see the relative yield gap, you know, the ecological versus the, over the economical. And, that, you know, that's an important message as well, is that, well, uh, across the continent, yield gaps are, you know, pure from an ecological standpoint, you know, how much could you potentially um, uh, produce are quite high, They're often in the order of four to ten tons even um, per hectare. It turns out that in, in our uh, computation, you know, the, the economic yield gap is a, over, overall about 25% of that. It varies, you know, it can be less, it can be a bit more. It is yellow, which you see is quite dominant, it's about, you know, maybe 40% or 30%. Um, but in some places, there's not, not that much made anyway. Um, but, it's, but it's quite a bit lower. And as I said earlier, our estimate is probably still too optimistic. So. Uh, I would expect that 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 um, you know realistically it may be just something like twenty percent or so. And so these yield gaps, understanding that they exist, is important because if they weren't there, well, there wouldn't be much you could do with any technology. Um, but 
presenting them as something that could be a, a, a attained by farmers um, really is not too meaningful unless you consider it in the context of prices. So what have we learned? Well, there is a lot of spatial variation in nitrogen use efficiency. So maybe between five and 53 kilogram grain per kilogram and applied um, at low levels. And it's probably a lot larger. It's probably between zero and something more than 50, but roughly that's sort of the numbers we find. And, and that's also roughly what the literature um, uh, uh, suggests. I think that the progress we've made or, or, or the way forward we show is like, well, you, you, you could be more specific about you know, which efficiency you might get where. Secondly, you know, variation in price are really important additional determinant of, of, of the, the relevance of, of fertilizer or, 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 or the scope that fertilizer um, could have in, or the scope of, of using fertilizer in, in increasing yields. And though we see that even, even of course, I, you know, I emphasize that the economic yield gaps are much lower than the ecological yield gaps, they're still pretty high. You know, it, it, it still, it seems still economically feasible to, to double um, uh, crop yields. So, that, so that's, a, that's really, you know, the glass half full kind of um, um, a result. And if you want to work on, on increasing yields, uh, whether it's be, be it through fertilizer or hopefully through more integrated approaches where, where you consider, um, uh, especially you know, kind of long-term soil fertility uh, aspects as well, um, there clearly are opportunities and fertilizer can play a role in that. How strong the incentives are uh, in different places it might vary. And, and this is also another sort of part of follow-up research is what, 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 what should happen is to see whether, you know, because wh whether fertilizer use can be predicted out of, out of our sort of analysis or out of that kind of analysis. Because there, there is fertilizer use in, in Africa, of course, and it varies a lot by location. Yields are quite high in some places. Um, on average, it may be low, but, you know, with Jordan, we're also working on, on, some, on some data in, in Ethiopia on, on maize yields, and they tend to be, you know, three, four, five, six tons per hectare. So um, does that match our expectations? Can we understand better, more broadly, you know, what is indeed, you know, when, when does become uh, you, you an incentive uh, uh, strong enough? And now just to, to, to wrap up a bit about the data science, science side of it. Um, so I think we've demonstrated that all data can be used for new science. We can, we can um, also look at old questions in new ways. Um, and, and I think what we've shown is just the beginning of, of trying to find our way, uh, model our way through it sort of how to best, best do this. Uh, of course, you, you get a lot of attention initially when you do these things first, but it will take, you know, many years to come, I think, to, to really refine these approaches. And, and I think that will happen because I think these empirical models will gain importance because more and more data will become available. Um, the question might be how to integrate that with these mechanistic models, how to best do that. And so because of that, interoperability for data aggregation will also become increasingly important. And I stress this is real bottleneck we faced with to, having to write these, these, these scripts um, for, for all these data sets. So I'll end, I'll end with sort of, you know, what we see the way forward. And that's this, this product we just started up to essentially first replicate what, we, what, what I've just shown by now rewriting these scripts in a way that they can be uh, expanded upon, that people can add to that, can improve them, can fix them, uh, to, to basically um, start a, a, a collaborative open project to, to compile all open research data for, for analysis like this. And this is called the Cairo Project. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but, but you know, the important, the, it, it is a lot of work to write a single script to go from any specific data set to something that is not messy, that is clean, that is, you know, has standard names, is organized in a standard way, you know, where variable names are, variables are actually variables and the single variable, the units are clear, that, and, and also where there's not too much missing information. So one of the uh, big chunks of work to do when you try to compile these data sets is actually, you know, going back to the papers and reading, you know, um, you know, what the soil data was or whatever else they observed that's not in the formal data set, but also, uh, you know, what are the latitude longitudes of these locations? It's often not reported, but they may have names. And so you can look up these latitude longitudes. So there's a lot of work to go from raw research data to uh, data that, that is more broadly uh, reusable. 
so this is basically the workflow we're working on. You know, we find data sets, write scripts, put them all together on the GitHub site. Then there's sort of a master script that runs all these individual uh, uh, scripts, aggregates all of that into a single database that can then be used for analysis like we did, uh, but also the aggregated data themselves become a new uh, data product for others to, to, to use. So here's the, uh, the, the GitHub site, so you can look at that. It's still very early days, um, uh, but be, be feel free to, um, to join and contribute to it. That's what um, um, I had to, um, uh, to say today. Um, so I wanted to leave quite a bit of time open for discussion, uh, and I think there is. Uh, and all questions should, of course, be directed to Jordan and Camila. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert, for very, yeah, very, very intense and very rich presentation today. Um, we have some questions on the chat, and also I have some my own questions, and I, I'm pretty sure we will have, um, yeah, we will also learn more. We will have more questions once we start learning more and also start using Carob. Uh, kind of, uh, the workflow uh, more and better. Okay, so let, let's start from question from Reese. Yeah, I mean, we have really a lot to unpack here, Robert. So uh, we we have seen uh, the price estimation, price modeling piece for fertilizer, maize, and also yield response. And you put all, all of them together uh, um, to show the ecological yield gap and some of the discussion around the yield gap. So maybe we can step back and okay, so let's start from the price. Uh, so Reese, Reese Manners from IIT, Reese is asking um, about the reliability of the price maps. I guess that also apply both for fertilizer price and maize price. So can you tell us a little bit more about, um, yeah, kind of the accountability yeah. or like error metrics of the yeah, estimation of price? Well, it, it's um, it's a very good question. It's a very difficult one to answer. There's no, there are no good ways to truly yeah. establish that, mm. uh, you know, because is you know uncertainty and those those kind of aspects of of, of um, statistical data analysis that you can have in experimental setups. It really doesn't apply uh, very well. I mean, you do cross validation and you show that it's reasonable, uh, but clearly there's uncertainty. And but but. Um, um, and prices, you know, as, as you know, you know, all of a sudden you get big inflation and prices change. And, and, as I, and I pointed out also, you know, the urea price, uh, you know, has, has all of a sudden gone through the roof because of energy prices. And um, I, I think that, the, and, and so it's somewhat an evasive answer. We don't have a clear answer to it. And we, we also saw like, you know, in, in, uh, in some countries, there's a lot of data. In other countries, there's no data. We nevertheless estimated that. We, you know, you, and you can use it two ways. You can say, well, then we use it as a national price. Or we use the general model. And I didn't go into the detail of how we actually model that but here you can use distance from ports you get all these variables which you can use to model prices um but the end yeah no it, it, it is um and then you get things like okay but the, what about okay the, the market price versus the farm gate price uh you know is the if i'm on my farm you know yeah i see a basically because that's what we have you have the prices of fertilizer in the market and the price of maize in the market and if my farm is far away from both you know that i can add a lot so there, there's a lot of uncertainty there uh, I think the important thing that we've done is to show that, well, even with that, clearly prices play a big role. Uh, let's, let's, and, and really, let's get better at, at trying to understand what these prices are, how to best model them, how uncertain they are, uh, and, how, and how to deal with that uncertainty. And, and so, it's, it's, it's um, so, so to the brief answer is, yeah, yeah they're rather uncertain. Um, so, so we, need, we need to, and we need to do better. Yeah, I, I can imagine there will be also um, the sensitivity to subsidy kind of policy um, and different types of cross-country informal trade. Yeah, I, I saw it was really striking uh, difference between like Ghana and Burkina Faso, or Robert, as you showed. And yeah, it, it will be quite the farmers ar around the border uh, area will be really incentivized <laughs> to make that uh, price difference as a, you know, you, you, yeah, you think, yeah. but also yeah. you think that, that there will be some leakage, and and, yeah. and that maybe it's also because of the exactly. exchange rates. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, I, so I would hope that economists or anyone interested in prices don't have to be economists, but that there will be more sort of. So economists don't really look at this this kind of thing so much. Mm -hmm. You know, they they it, it, they might they, academically it's not that interesting, and it's it's very applied, and and but I think that could be actually, or it would seem not that interesting, but I think it actually could be 
So if you really want to understand price formation and, and spatial variation, and, you know, I think if you if you do well, Reese, if you to pick this up, you could be the next, you know, you can not have a Nobel Prize because they never seem to really know who, who to give them to. So, so um, you know, you have to work 10 years on it. But but I think there's a lot, lot of scope there for, for uh, 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 interesting learning. Absolutely. And, and now that we have this framework, I think that's really um, one of the it could have been one of the bottlenecks and, and now I think we can also do maybe sensitivity analysis and different kind of seasonality and are uh, looking at uh, asking different types of questions and identify what kind of data need to be collected when and how many data point to really um, you know the, improve the quality and performance of random first model and things like this. I think yeah I think this is really great beginning uh, of that yeah that new new uh, gaining even more more new insight. Uh, okay, good. Um, thanks. And uh, Reese, and, and yeah, if if this, I hope this answers some of the question you you are having. Uh, but yeah, if not, you can ask more questions. And, and Francis is also asking, um, yeah, so nutrient uh, in that kind of list of variables that uh, you you were able to um, kind of disentangle from the yield response, and yeah, is there any time series of soil nutrition, a soil nutrient uh, map that can be utilized in that kind of yield response function? I think again because soil carbon and soil nitrogen, uh, yeah, that that changes over time depending on how farmers manage the soil and also seasonality and weather condition and things. So how how detailed can we do that? I think that would be an important question to ask. Yeah, I think that opens the door to to. Um I think you know this kind of model um, is pretty general and, and and smooth. You know, so many observations, and hopefully, you know, you have this this variability between fields, but hopefully, they're all sort of you know in somewhat different states, and 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 you get a broad, well, you know, view of, of at some regional scale. I mean, it's not, but but. Um, and, and these differences we see are are, are meaningful. That's what I hope. Um, if you if you consider lo more local variation, not quite the question, but I think it's important to go into that a bit. You know, if you take a field, a farmer's fields, of course, you know, even in the field you get a tremendous variation, as we well know. Let alone between fields or or nearby fields on you know on the slope. Um, and there's no way we can capture it at all because we just don't, don't have the soils data. I mean, there is you know you have now the the, the soils data available. At, uh, is it 30 meters or 90 meters um, red spatial resolution, but you know, that's just a, your your raster the cell size. You, you really don't have any information yeah. at, 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 at that kind of uh, resolution. So uh, it's a great question. I, it's hard to know again how important that is for this general model uh, that has data. You know, because the model, in fact, you, know, you could say that the model is taken as much as possible from observations that were made when the data were collected. So we have yield, we have fertilizer, and we have the soil condition at that time. Not always. So then, we, when not, we take it from these grids. Now these grids, they're also pretty smooth. So, so, so it seems a pretty general uh, uh, um, uh, signal with that. But for any specific location, any specific conditions, you know, uh, because of management, other things, or or, or small scale variation, yeah, we, we just cannot capture that. And I don't think that's going to be possible anytime soon by anyone to do because because it's so hard to do. But but what what it means then is that um, this kind of approach can help you broadly identify. Regional differences that can also help you give you more mm -hmm. regional uh, fertilizer recommendations, but they always have to be embedded in saying, well, you know, given your conditions and given uh, given what your fertilizer was responsible last year, or given what what local soil type you have. I mean, so, so and I'm saying all this because there's a lot of sort of interest in giving these uh, doing all this site specific um, uh, recommendations. It's, there are real opportunities there, but it's also very easy to oversell that, you know, and so I think, yeah. I think you know, Francis kind of alluded to to those kind of problems. So, yeah. so sorry for the long answer, but but I think it's a very important point to to. Uh, yeah, uh, but I think that there might be some. I would say Camila too, by the way. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, the, uh, Jordan and Camila, yeah, feel free to jump in. Uh, just adding to that, Robert, uh, I I wonder even if the exact monitoring is really hard of the soil property over time. Uh, maybe this could be also useful framework again for decision support. If nitrogen, soil nitrogen can be improved by, uh, increased by 
five percent over I don't know like three cropping seasons, then what will be the implication of the profitability down the road? I think uh, again this kind of approach can be useful to gain new insight, and then yeah, that will also inform what kind of data we can uh, really leverage, what kind of sensors and different modeling tools and data collection tool can be utilized. So again, yeah, lots of interesting uh, in uh, ideas can be inspired from this. Okay, good. Um, so and. and uh, Sik, uh, your name was mentioned <laughs> during the webinar, um, and uh, yeah, I'm really uh, glad to see you, you joining us today. So, uh, and you also asked very important question about uh, non-nitrogen uh, soil nutrient like uh, zinc and phosphorus, etc. So, I, I wonder, uh, Sik, if you are able to speak, uh, can you maybe maybe uh, ask your question? And sorry for <laughs> putting you on the spot, but I think it will be really uh, yeah, great to hear from you and see you. OK, great. Perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you again for this so important work. I think it should really inform, could be as important as soil analyses. I hate to say it, but it's always about we measure <laughs> soils as best we can from space and locally. But in fact, all of those nutrient analyses were originally calibrated with what? Fertilizer response trials. So you're going back to the source. Brilliant work. I remember you talking about this years ago and I thought, oh, nice dream, but you did it. Um, so I'm excited to see the phosphorus fertilizer response data. I also was very informed by that work, which was done by Ickersat and Wagenhagen um, and a professor, Andreas Bukhart, I think, on showing that phosphorus was important in West Africa, but more than nitrogen, and also that it, 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 it conferred drought tolerance often. So phosphorus deficiency may be as important as drought. So I would um, wondering if there's any thought about taking this to policymakers, or is there any examples where policymakers have thought about phosphorus-rich fertilizer sources? I also have a related question in that I'm very worried that there's so much emphasis on zinc recently, we might actually be tying up phosphorus and be using more fer uh, expensive fertilizers. If you want to comment on any of that, thanks so much. I'll take your, my answer offline. I don't have. Uh, yeah, I th thank you very much, Sik, for 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 uh, your kind words and and a very interesting question. I really don't have an answer to it. Um, sp specifically, maybe Jordan can, but I I, um, I I just don't know. I have certainly not done the uh, effort to to take. Uh, you know, send a paper around, and I've seen um, some interesting responses from from people, but but um, specifically that phosphorus. No, I don't know. Yeah, just to jump in, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, but I think that the, most of the discussions that I've been involved in have been in Eastern and Southern Africa, where nitrogen is, is a much bigger story. So I think as, as we kind of take this this work into other kind of policy and, and science contexts, um, that that the uh, uh, phosphorus story and, and, and other uh, kind of uh, nutrient stories will, will become more important. And, and certainly that would be uh, one direction to take this work in. Can I also just make make a, a comment about this that I think is already there, but um, you know, is I mean, these results are, are really, I think the basic story is really important, even as, as simple as it is, right? It's 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 a it's been kind of critically overlooked the fact that 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 responses, agronomic response is only part of the story, right? And so this is you know, with all the imperfections in the data, it's really an important step forward. And these results are also, you can take them as very conservative results in at least two ways. I mean, one, we're using trials data, uh, which is, as you all know, uh, have kind of um, systematically higher response rates than we tend to observe on, on, on farmer's field and observational data. And then the other point that Robert already mentioned is that we're modeling market prices rather than farm gate prices. And so when you kind of consider those two factors, we're really giving a very conservative um, uh, correction here to the kind of um, uh, the, the way that, that fertilizer responses uh, tend to be suggested as, as this silver bullet, when in many areas they, they just don't make sense from a farmer perspective. So I just wanted to reemphasize that. Yeah, I was muted. I was muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks for the comment. Uh, 
Uh, Jordan, yes, indeed, this is really conservative uh, kind of, again, the basis for future work. So, yeah, again, this, I hope this will open a lot of insight uh, and yeah, inspirational uh, inspiration for future work. And yeah, I'm also personally quite excited to have this framework as a presented in in very coherent way like this, so that uh, we can contribute to future data collection and, and also data sharing, also uh, data interoperability, a very difficult task uh, that we that we really show the value. Once you have all these data ready for uh, kind of further research and easier for other researchers to also take it forward, and this is the kind of work we can do. So yeah, there are a lot of values that we can uh, add from here. Okay, good. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn, uh, Robert, your focus to the uh, next question from Bill, Bill Burke. Uh, so he is asking, um, uh, prices are hugely important, um, but also risk and discount rate, and especially regarding the latter, the risk and discount rate, the value of money later is much lower than we often assume. So yeah, any reaction to uh, Bill's comment, Robert? Probably should let Jordan do that, being the, being the <laughs> economist. But but it's it's a fair point. Um, you know, I, in, early on the slides, so you have you know I, I had something of like you know there there's risk and insurance and, there's, and you know we, we we kept that out of the equation just to stay simple. So there there's but but there's certainly that. And indeed, the question is is you know it goes it goes back to this incentive. Uh, what what is what you know, how much money are you are you willing to invest for for how much profits how much far how much uh, you know how far away in time it you know um it's not that obvious and so you'll and you and and um it's also very you're you know, it's very easy to sort of overlook um um uh, it's essentially cash flow uh, uh, uh limitations but maybe jordan should speak more to this well i mean i i it's a great comment and and I fully agree that those factors are important. And and again, I mean, you know, so so I really see this 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 as an important um, but incomplete step forward. And so you know, we've talked about moving this work into kind of a more stochastic framework where we more explicitly look at variations in response to variations in prices. And that would start to get at some of the risk element. I mean, we'd have to take a different tack to to build in kind of you know uh, idiosyncratic discounting uh, from from a, a pharma perspective, but yeah, very, very valid points. <laughs> Just, you know, there's only so much you can do at once, right? And so we kind of have to build this up bit by bit, um, but but I fully agree with the comments. Okay, um, thanks for the question. I'll be here and answer from Jordan and Robert. So uh, yeah, we are right at the top of the hour. Uh, thanks so much for everyone joining. Uh, uh, Camilla, before we close, uh, any final remark as a lead author of this great paper? Uh, no. <laughs> so uh, thank Robert yeah, yeah, you yeah, for yeah. presenting because it was uh, very nice to see all the work uh, from and not have it to present and from a different perspective, which is also yeah. nice. Yeah. Uh, Camilla, maybe I, I can ask you the final last comment, uh, right question. Uh, so as you have done all the data work, uh, it must be really hard at the beginning because we, when CGI researchers publish data and data share uh, for other people to do, we, we didn't necessarily have this kind of scope of how this will enable this kind of research. But this is really first time we are seeing the value of our data sharing work. So do you have any suggestion or something that could have made your work easier, <laughs> less painful <laughs> to do that for the future? No, endeavor. well, actually, yeah, no, actually it was like uh, Robert said, it was we couldn't have done without Guardian. Actually, it was uh, it saved my PhD. So thank you for that. And no, the problem we had some of the problems, but it was uh, with the results and if they were minimal, I, I think. But for example, sometimes when I was downloading the data, uh, it was an Excel file, but then you open the Excel and it was like a PDF uh, oh. pre screenshot or something. So I had to rewrite the, the data or things like that, uh, or many uh, tabs in the Excel that you actually need to put them all together to, to make um, 
the database, but also is because that was what I need. You know, I, I ensemble the scripts to what I need, mm -hmm. but maybe for other people work. But the PDF thing was him. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, but yeah. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we, we have to keep reminding people PDF is not a data. <laughs> yeah, right. OK, great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, thanks so much for great work. Uh, we have been already uh, kind of uh, generating a lot of interest and yeah, insight into this kind of work. Uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks so much for all the work and presentation today. Um, and we will close the webinar today. And yeah, again, the, I share the link to the full text the PDF file on the chat and the recording will be edited and upload to will be uploaded to YouTube uh, big data platform YouTube channel. Um, I, I don't have the link that right now, but yeah, you, you can quickly search uh, from YouTube, I guess. And yeah, um, thank, thanks so much for everyone joining today and hope you great rest of the day and happy holidays. OK, thanks. Bye. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Bye. Thank you.